hello everyone hi what's going on i'm chef jenny i'm gonna be your instructor hello, today hello, it's everybody. wonderful to see you friends hi. happy thursday we are almost there go <laughs> almost to the weekend easter weekend happy easter to y'all happy passover happy spring Sporting the spring colors. Oh, Lena's got the spring background. Snaps, Lena. Well done. Well done. Wonderful to see you guys today. We're here in Seattle. It is raining like crazy outside. So it's like we call this soup weather. You know what I mean? Hopefully, show us, send us in the chat. Where are you guys joining us from? We want to know. It's uh, rainy. It's cold. So we're actually, we're very, for many reasons, very excited for the soup recipe today. Hopefully you all are doing well. Spring has sprung, got blossoms everywhere. In Seattle, it's like a big thing with the cherry blossoms. There's cherry blossoms everywhere. It's so pretty. It's causing all the allergies, but it's so pretty, y'all. Can't get enough of it. Um, really excited about this class today. We're so happy you're joining us because we've got friends joining us, and we love friends, not just you homemaders, but we've got the wonderful, incredible people at the American Diabetes Association joining us today. We've got Liz, and we've got, or I think we might have Viola joining, and we've got Molly, so say hello to them. They're incredible. The amazing Liz is going to be uh, joining us throughout the class, giving great um, nutritional information and sharing info with us about diabetes and kidney health. And we've also got Davida joining us. And the wonderful people at Davida, they're a, a kidney organization and a dialysis organization, and they're going to be sharing with us info about kidney health. So all, any of you who um, might be type 2, type 1, pre-diabetic, maybe um, thinking about just how I can you cook and prove recipes for uh, a healthier lifestyle might also not know that um, healthier cooking can affect and improve your kidney health as well. So the two are really intrinsically linked and um, we're so excited and proud to be sharing a recipe with you today that really is good for people who are, first of all, just like good tasting food. First and foremost, delicious tasting food. That's what this soup is. It is a chicken wild rice asparagus soup, a creamy, wild rice and asparagus soup. Yum. Love all of that. And then it's also good, um, just first, first and foremost, delicious. And then it is excellent for um, if you're trying to eat healthier in reference to keeping your sugars down, but also for kidney health. So we're going to learn so much today, guys. So we're glad you're joining us. Uh, hopefully you're cooking along with us. Share your cameras. If we are, we love to see you. Let me see it. Raise your hands if you're cooking along with us. Yes, Lena. Yes. Oh, love when you guys cook along with us. I love to see your beautiful faces. So if you are so inclined, please share your camera with us so we can see you all. Uh, party with you makes it. Oh, yes. Hello, everyone. We've got Christina running the chat today. Please say hello to her. She's the best. Hi, everybody. Oh. Um, we've got uh, Elise on from... Um, Hi, Elise from Davida and she's going to be helping us answer some really great questions and then as always if you like just like Jenny said if you want yeah. to ask a question or interact in the uh, with Jenny or Elise just turn on your camera make sure your camera's on and raise your virtual hand which is down uh, kind of a, in the bottom <laughs> of the tray there but we'd love to chat with you yes hello Elise welcome Hello, hello. Um, so, Elise, we're going to be um, bringing you in at times to talk about kidney health. Um, do we want to start her off now and just in a letter introduce herself real quick? Yeah. If you're able to, Elise. Hello. There we go. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Hey, it's good to see you all. I see so many of your faces. Um, so, my name is Elise. I'm based out of Virginia, and I work in dialysis. So I've been in this population for about 10 years and um, yeah, I'm super excited to be here. I work with, a, I've worked with a lot of CKD patients as well and AKA patients too, and obviously dialysis patients. So <laughs> mm -hmm. I have lots of great um, experience and I'm happy to share any sort of tips with you in the cooking world. We do a lot of focus on low sodium um, and complex carbs and lots of good other things. So I'm happy to be here and just let me know if you have any questions. Great. Thank you, Elise. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Well, 
we've met all, this is a good one, guys. It's such a privilege and it's really a lucky thing to be able to have such amazing resources at your fingertips. So I'm gonna reiterate again. If you have questions about um, diabetes health, about kidney health, just about um, healthier nutritional cooking in general, please raise your hands. We really wanna interact with you today and hear all these questions. If you're a little camera shy, then just throw those questions in the chat. Christina's gonna uh, make sure she waves this down and make sure those get asked. So without further ado, we're gonna get into it. You guys ready? Oh, I'm hungry just thinking about this. So if you're cooking along, hopefully you all have the recipe, you can follow along. These videos will be up on our site um, starting tomorrow. So then if you wanna cook along, you can go back to them and, and cook with us um, whenever you want. So first things first, chicken. There's chicken in this soup. So we are gonna start making our chicken. We're gonna do, we're looking for about two cups of cooked chicken. So I just, we're starting about with a pound here. The chicken we're using is breast. So we're using boneless, skinless um, white chicken breast. So you can use whatever you want. This is the leanest, so that's what we wanted to use. We're gonna poach ours. Now, if you have already cooked chicken, go for it. That's what we'll add to the soup. I just wanna um, remind you that both for diabetes cooking and for healthier um, kidney uh, cooking, we wanna watch our sodium. So if you go ahead and use rotisserie chicken, which is a really great hack for easy wheat night mills to get a rotisserie chicken shredded, those rotisserie chickens can have a lot of salt added to it. So that's just something to think about if you're gonna do that. So we're gonna poach ours here. Poaching's so easy, it's just throwing in water. So I have a pan back here, if you can see, uh, back there, with some cold water. That's the, that's the best thing I can share with you about how you make great poached chicken, not super dried out chicken, is that you wanna start the chicken in some cold water. So I've got my breast here, kinda cut up into even pieces. And I'm gonna go ahead and add them into the cold water here. That's gonna allow more even cooking. If you're ever making mashed potatoes, this is how you also boil your potatoes. You don't throw potatoes in hot boiling water. You add it in cold water and start it off with that. So I'm adding those in here. Again, we're watching our sodium. So we're not gonna add any salt in, but if you want to, if that's okay for your diet, go ahead. And we're gonna bring this up to a simmer. And once it's at a simmer, once it's boiling, I'm gonna turn it off, I'm gonna cover it, and wait, the temperature we're looking for is around 160 degrees, between 160 and 165. We're gonna throw it into the soup and it's gonna further cook to make sure it gets to temp. 165 is the safe cooking temp we're looking for. So that should be good there and we'll just take some forks and shred it. And that's gonna be for later at the end. So that's first up, got our chicken going. Next up, I want to talk to you about wild rice. That's the star, along with the asparagus, of this soup. Look at this beautiful wild rice. Oh, it's got such a great color to it. This is cooked, and we're going to need cooked wild rice for this recipe. Before it's cooked, this is what it looks like. It's really dark. It's got this outer shell on it, and but then a nice, soft, tender center. The outer shell's a little chewy, but once it cooks, it kind of splits open. So there's so many varieties of wild rice in the store. Make sure you look at the cooking directions. Look sure, make sure you look at the content. You're not wanting to buy wild rice that already has seasonings added to it. Again, we don't want added sugar. We definitely don't want added salt or fat. So sometimes a quick cooking wild rice will have the seasoning packets separate. So if so, just leave those out and use the rice itself. There could be some instant ones out there. What we're looking for is the rice is to be cooked before we add it to the soup. Wild rice, again, based on the cooking directions, we got this in bulk, which is great, because I find that's the most affordable and the easiest is just to get it in bulk. It can take, it took us anywhere somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour. It can take a long time. So just give yourself plenty of time to cook this. If you are doing it, start it now. Now's the time to start. So um, add that in. I always like to rinse my rice. It's about a three to one ratio, three parts water to one part rice um, to make wild rice. And so that's just something to think about. Starting it off, make sure you don't add extra salt or seasonings to it. You do you, whatever you find. 
Wild rice is actually a heritage American food. So I love wild rice. I love that. And what I mean by that, it's indigenous to North America. So indigenous peoples um, harvested it a ton. It grows in water. So it's a really heritage American food. There's not many of those heritage grains. So I think that's really special. And it's got a ton of nutritional benefits to it. Um, Liz, if you want to talk about, Liz from the American Diabetes Association, about the health benefits of wild rice, I think this would be a perfect time. And I'll put it back on the camera on it. Here, if you guys can see. There she is. Go, just getting Liz's mic on. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> Thanks, Chef Jenny. Hi. So yeah, uh, that was a really interesting fact to learn that wild rice was uh, indigenous, considered an indigenous starch. Um, it's not very high in calories. A three and a half ounce serving has about 101 calories. And it's a pretty decent source of a lot of different micronutrients, man manganese, copper, zinc, phosphorus, magnesium, B6 and folate. There's also a little bit of uh, fiber that it also provides the diet. So it's definitely a great, um, a great starch to have with the meal. That's great. Thanks so much, Liz. Mm. Hey, I get Liz. Kind of, I get I kind of, a, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yes, sorry, Christina. Jenny, sorry. Um, this is Christina. Uh, Liz, uh, could there be like a wild rice breakfast situation? Ooh. Like, could it be like a porridge or something like that? Is that a, is that a thumbs up or what do you think about that? You could, you, you could. I've not, I haven't seen it done just yet, but I don't so want to ooh. tell you that it's not possible. Um, it's, you know, I've seen quinoa being made as a mm -hmm. porridge, a breakfast meal. So why mm. not try it with wild rice? Um, I'd give it a try and see how you like it. I mean, it's a great, it's the good hot, you know, good, um, good source of fiber. You can have it as a base and why not? Let's give it a try. You okay. absolutely could. I love that suggestion, Christina. <laughs> Honestly, any kind of plant-based milks with the wild rice and adding some spices to it. Spices add flavor, but they're not adding sodium. They're not adding sugar. Things like nutmeg, cinnamon, cardamom could be a beautiful breakfast situation and really start your day off, which is great with protein and fiber, which is really important to help keep you full, um, keep you energized, so you won't crash later and then eat a bunch of sugar. So I always love starting my morning off with fiber or protein. So great suggestion. So we've got our rice. I, I do have a little trivia. Let's see, let's see how we w awake our, I know it's the end of the week. I'm sorry to do this to all, to all of you, especially those who are like in middle end of spring break mode right now. Trivia might be too overwhelming, but if you've got it, does anyone know which state wild rice is the official grain of? Let's see. Don't mm. Google. I can see you guys if you're Google. Okay, we're getting some. We're getting some. All right, some let me hear it, Christina. And it is okay. Minnesota by a landslide. It's I Minnesota. Yes, <laughs> huzzah! You guys are too smart for us. I I learned that yesterday when I was researching this class. I feel like I'm ready for Jeopardy now. Like that's a, <laughs> that's a core memory I formed. That Minnesota's official grain is wild rice. Let, shout out to you, lovely people in Minnesota. If you're living in Minnesota right now, let us know what your favorite wild rice recipe is. <laughs> Love to hear it. I'm just imagining the streets lined with wild rice. Lined where you just, with like, wild rice. Walk along and just like gather some in your hand and it's go home. It's Halloween. And cook. What do you get? You get a handful of wild rice. <laughs> that's why it's just. That's what I'm picturing. It's completely yeah. Illogical. Yeah, it's a whole picture. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Um, I thought that was a fun fact. I used to work for General Mills, who's headquartered in Minnesota. So wonderful times there, beautiful state. Shout out to anyone from Minnesota. So we've got our chicken poaching. Hopefully you've started your rice. If not, start it if you're cooking along with this, because that's gonna take the longest. I'm now gonna start working on our veg for our soup base. So very common, onion, about half a cup of onion. I'm just using half an onion here. I really like white onions. I feel like they've got the best overall flavor, runner up being yellow. Use whatever you got. I wouldn't use a red onion for this, but white or yellow. If you're in the wonderful state of Washington, which we are, Walla Walla onions are a big thing here. So 
been making a ton of onion dip, just playing around with that. You want finely diced. Get these going. I feel like any soup should start off with at least onions. And there's garlic in here too, so also start mincing your garlic. We're gonna do three garlic cloves. And like we say, anytime you're starting with a soup, a sauce, you want to make sure that your veg, the most important thing is that it's roughly cut the same size. That's the biggest important thing to know here because then everything's going to cook at the same rate. So finish getting up my onions here. I do not know what's up with these onions, but I'm okay. I'm not crying. It's, I never know when I'm just going to have mascara streaming down my face in class. It gets me every time. I always think my glasses are going to protect me, but all they do is trap the gas and just it completely take myself out. I do find that sticking my head in the freezer is the quickest, most effective way to stop the onion sobbing from happening. Also, turning your vent on will suck up a lot of that gas. Putting something wet around your board because the gas is attracted to moisture. So it'll stop you from getting really teared up. It's my favorite question to ask. How do you stop yourself from crying with onions? There's a lot of old wise tales out there, a lot of fun trivia of how people do it that swear by it. The one I know that absolutely does not work for me, one that's floated around for a long time, is holding a match in your mouth as you're cutting it. I still do not understand where this came from. It's, I'm assuming it came from Big Match that they put it out there, they hold a match stick in your mouth to keep it yourself from crying. I, that's the only logical way I know where that rumor came from. Never worked for me. All right, so we got our garlic and our onion here. Yum, yum, yum. The start to every great meal, garlic and onion. If there was a candle of garlic and onion, I think I would have it for my house. You know good things are happening when you've got that smell. Okay, I'm just gonna update you back here on my chicken. It came to a simmer, turned it off, covering it. Just gonna keep it in there. I'll check it in about 10 minutes. So, I've got my soup pot here. Oh, I love getting out the big soup pot. Do you guys have a big soup pot? Oh, it, it always means like either really good tomato sauce, like Nani's tomato sauce about to be made, or delicious soup. So, I've got some butter in here. You can absolutely not use butter if you wanna reduce your amount of saturated fat. Any plant-based butter or any plant-based fat is good. I would love a veg oil or olive oil here. Avocado is great too. It's really kind of up to you what you got in your kitchen. So we're starting off with a little butter here, but again, you wanna watch your sat fat. Please feel free to use any of those vegetable oils. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna add in my garlic and my onions. We're gonna go with medium heat here. The reason being that I do not wanna burn that garlic. If you burn garlic, you're kind of, it, you can't come back, guys. It leaves such a bitter, I almost interpret it sometimes like as a, a, a metal, metallic or, or chemical note, because that burn is so bitter, you can't go back. You can add all the booze, all the butter, all the things we're used to adding to make things delicious to it, that flavor still be there. So always watch it when you got garlic in here. I'm gonna melt this up. We're just gonna get this tender. Add it for a couple of minutes. Usually in a soup, you start with something called a mirepoix. That's a French word. That's first day of culinary school, you learn about a mirepoix, which is carrots, celery, and onions. But here we've got the onions and the garlic. The recipe, I just wanna let you guys know. <laughs> in the ingredients statement, it does say carrot, or in the directions it says carrot, but it's left off the ingredients statement. You have a carrot, dice it up. I would add it in here right now. Go for it. If not, it's gonna be still delicious because we have that flavor of the wild rice and asparagus. Christina, we got a question? We do have a question from the famous Debbie C. Oh, Debbie C. Here she comes. Oh, same here. Hi, Deb. Who's the famous? Absolutely. The famous. Inf in, not infamous. Famous. 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 Capital F famous. It's all positive because you're one of our favorites. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Y'all are my favorites, too. Um, so I was wondering, I may have missed it, but did you put anything with the chicken while you were poaching it? Does no. it not help to... 
Doesn't help to put anything with it. You can absolutely add some aromatic veg, like some onion, celery, carrot, if you want. You could add a handful of peppercorns in there. Any herbs you have in your fridge, most will work. So parsley, uh, bay leaf, uh, thyme, rosemary, sage can go in there and it'll kind of imbue the chicken with that flavor. Do what you want. We're going really simple because this has so much flavor in here. But I think the biggest thing that I want you to avoid is adding salt in with the chicken. That's the biggest one. But you do you. I mean, any of those things that you think pair well with like all those kind of classic flavorings with chicken, you can add in there in the poach. And Jenny, can you keep that liquid or? You can absolutely keep that liquid, especially if you add the aromatics in there. That's kind of making a quick chicken broth. I still would use a proper chicken broth for this soup because really good broth takes a long time to develop flavor and you especially it really helps you need something with the bones. So that broth I think will be too light for the soup, but you can use a starter of any of your meals, maybe in an Instapot, if you're making a casserole, if you wanna make a soup or a chili, you can totally use that because chili has a ton of flavor in it. Um, where you don't need as deep or condensed flavor from the chicken. So waste not, want not. That's good stuff, man. Have, have it as a little broth drink if you want. <laughs> if you're feeling a little, it's the sniffly time right now, so go for it. Great question, Deb. Thank you. Okay, these guys are starting to get tender up. Oh, uh, that smell. Come on. I love that smell. Okay, now we're going to add a little bit of herbs to this. So I have in here some salt. And I just want to say, if you want to emit the salt, you can. Again, everyone's diets are going to be different and health requirements can be different. If you know you have to be on a strictly salt-free diet, you fully emit it. I've got some dry thyme. If you have fresh thyme in your garden or if your fridge right now, please go ahead and do that. Either or will be delicious. Fresh ground pepper, I can't recommend fresh ground pepper enough. It's got such a much more intense and bright peppery flavor than pre-ground because once you grind it, it starts to lose its flavor. So I love freshly ground pepper. A bay leaf, and then we have a little bit of nutmeg. This is pre-ground. I think this is such a fun addition. Got a little nutmeg in here. Kind of goes to a traditional thing you see with a lot of creamy soups or sauces. A very French thing to add. So we've got pre-ground nutmeg, or if you want, I got a little nutmeg guy here. So if you can buy whole nutmeg, like I said, you'll get more intense flavor because it's freshly ground. I just got a microplane here. You can go ahead and grate a little in here, just a little. It's up to you. I expect no one to have a whole nutmeg, fresh nutmeg clove in their home. You do the best you can, right? But if you do have one, go for it. So I'm gonna add the spices in here right now. We got a question, Christina? No, I just I just love nutmeg and I always I feel like such a chef when I like grate my little nutmeg and especially for baking, like there's nothing quite like it. But then recently yeah. like we've been doing it in cream sauces and and more kind of milky things and it's it adds something special. So do you add it if you ever make like a mac and homemade mac and cheese sauce at home or a cheese sauce? I do now. That sounds amazing. It's kind of a life hack. Any kind of dairy like creamy sauces, nutmeg is a very traditional pairing. If you've ever had like a croque monsieur or croque madame sandwich, that's a French like very indulgent sandwich, by the way. Not help, not mindful cooking at all, but it's because ham and cheese and all the stuff. But nutmeg is always in that sauce. Bechamel is one of what we call the mother sauces in French cooking. There's five main sauces you learn in like culinary school that kind of the basis of all cooking. And bechamel is one of them. And that's kind of your basic cream sauce. And that always has a little nutmeg in there. And I agree with feeling fancy. It's, it's hard to feel fancy these days. I mean, we're all so busy with work. It's raining, but like just like grating a little nutmeg makes me feel like I've really won the day, guys. Honestly, that is my kind of fancy. It's like, a just a little things. nutmeg. I'm going to go back and put my slippers on. Like, that's about as much fancy as I can handle little, right now. It's just the little things. Whatever you can do, guys, right? Mmm. I don't know, Christy, if you can smell this, but adding all those spices in here really woke up this veg. I, I'm smelling it. It smells good. Mm. Okay. 
Now we're gonna do another very traditional step in making a creamy soup. So we want it like a thick, creamy soup. We have our almond milk that we're adding. We have our little nutmeg for that flavor, but what's really gonna tighten this all up is adding flour. We have our fat in here, and by adding equal parts fat and flour and cooking it together, we make this thickening base called a roux. That's another French word. The French have completely taken over all culinary terms. I don't know how that happened, but that's what we've got. So mirepoix is the start, and then the thickener is a roux, R-O-U-X, roux. I have very, I have a lot of chef friends who've named their pets Roo, and I can't, I always find it adorable. Consider <laughs> it if you have a pet, I'm calling them Roo. I've not yet met a child named Roo, but that would be extra adorable, guys. So I'm adding my flour in here and just cooking it. You wanna cook it out. You wanna give it a couple of minutes of cooking out. The reason being is you kinda have that raw flour flavor and so you wanna give it one or two minutes. There is a technique of getting this very dark brown, which is very traditional in like New Orleans cooking. So if you're making gumbo, you would have a really dark roux. That's not what we're looking for here. We're not looking to caramelize this flour, get it toasty. We're just looking for it to cook out that raw flavor, like two minutes. We got a question, Christina? Uh, those bay leaves, we just put those in there. Do they, yeah. is it like, do they ever, burn or like is there anything you need to watch out for with bay leaves i've never burned a bay leaf the only thing you have to watch out for is this is not digestible you need to take this guy out at the end it's there for flavor it is not meant to eat dried bay leaves are, are they I mean, you could pressure cook them for hours and those things don't break apart and they can actually kind of scratch your throat or your esophagus. I used to teach large groups of cooking classes where people were here and we would make gumbo or sauces with the bay leaf. I didn't hear what anyone was saying. For 45 minutes, all I was thinking was, tell them to take out the bay leaf, tell them to take out the bay leaf, tell them to take out the bay leaf. So I'm telling you now, take out the bay leaf at the end. It's not edible. But I don't know about you, Christina, I do have people who are not cooks when I'm cooking, like, does that really make a difference? <laughs> I think it makes such a difference. And it has just this botanical warmth, this warm herbiness, mm -hmm. herbiness, herbaceousness. What are we using here? I don't read so good, but I know that it's meant to be in here, okay? So always add a bay leaf if you got it. Cooking out that flour. Next step. We've got some chicken stock here. Biggest thing to remember, low sodium, right? If you make it yourself, you know you can get it sodium free. There might be some sold in the store that free of sodium. Again, this is all based on your personal health status and your diet. I always buy low sodium chicken broth or stocks, vegetable beef, regardless, because I want to control my salt. So when you buy them, you never know how much salt you're getting. Oftentimes it's more than I want. So uh, that's a little trick. Um, I also like to look for things in the gradient statement, like making sure there's not artificial coloring in there. Sometimes it's easier for me. I just buy organic stock, honestly, if you're not making your own, because at least I know I have a guarantee of what's in that gradient statement. It's up to you. So we've got our broth here. We also have a fun little addition. Happy weekend, y'all. Starting the weekend early, vermouth. Ooh, ha cha cha. So vermouth, yeah, I mean, we're getting it going, guys. Vermouth is a fortified Italian wine. It's botanical, if you know what I mean by that. Kind of like gin, like botanical. It's meant to be an after dinner, like an aperitif, something that kind of cleanses the palate a little bit. Um, so it's got a lot of interesting flavor to it. Again, this is one where I definitely could see a lot of people maybe who are on the call are like, I cannot have that, totally understand. Just make up that amount of wine with extra stock or really honestly, even just water if you want. Veg stock would be great as well. Just add that a little bit, but it's kind of like adding sherry to a cream soup. I think that's what its purpose is here. Yes, Christina, what do we got? Um, what do you think about if you don't have vermouth using sherry or would you recommend like a white wine or what, what do you think? I would use sherry, honestly, because I think that for a cream soup, I feel like a sherry is really good. Well, you have to understand what we're using here is dry wine. We're using um, dry vermouth. 
If you were using sherry, use dry sherry. Even if you didn't have sherry, you could use a white wine, but dry. What I mean by that is the way they classify alcohols is either dry or sweet. Dry means it's not heavily sugary, it's not overly sweet. So it's a really, we don't want that extra sugar here. We're just looking for kind of some acidity. I would even, if you've got it, maybe squeeze a little bit. If you're just making this up with stock and not going to use this, add a little squeeze of lemon in here because you're getting acid from this. Maybe a little drizzle of apple cider vinegar. Just, just trying to get some balance, okay? So we've got our roux here. It's kind of cooked out. I'm gonna slowly add in my broth to start. I don't want all this flour to clump up, okay? So if I add all my liquid at once, it's really gonna kind of shock this whole pot here. And it's gonna get a ton of lumps, and then that's a whole separate thing. If any of you have Thanksgiving gravy trauma, this is, might be a triggering event for you <laughs> because this is usually the part where Thanksgiving gravy seizes and then either a giant fight or a breakdown ensues in the kitchen. It's usually the tipping point. It's never the reason. It's just kind of like the last straw, you know, on a big Thanksgiving day. So adding all that liquid. You see by just adding a little at a time, controlling my amount of lumpage here. Mm. Cooked out that raw flour taste. If you don't want to use flour, you can absolutely use, if, um, if, especially if you have a sensitivity to gluten, you can use your favorite gluten-free flour, same amount. You can use cornstarch. I think there's a quarter a cup of flour in this, so I would use half the amount of cornstarch. Maybe use two tablespoons of cornstarch. But instead of cooking it, you don't need to cook the cornstarch. What I would do is skip that step of toasting it in the pan, take a little bit of the cornstarch with some ch cold chicken broth and whisk it to make a little slurry. So add these two, and then the last step, add your cornstarch in there. Because we don't need to toast it, and we definitely don't want to create a lump, and the slurry helps create a lump-free situation. So just add in this in. Slow go, you see the thickness in there. Add a little more. Going, going, here we go. Mm. And then now I'm gonna add my vermouth, whatever liquid you're adding, and add that in. Honestly, I would eat just this. This smells incredible right now. Yum. Holy How are we moly. doing out there? Uh, we're doing great. Um, Elise just put in the chat how much sodium is in uh, like a store-bought broth, and it is no. many milligrams. It is 800 milligrams. 800 milligrams. Oh, my gosh. You are, Holy moly. We're laying out truth bombs, and I'm grateful for it, <laughs> but I need a moment. That is that is like a salt lick you have in a barn. Well, yeah, whoa. This is why I buy low sodium. Honestly, this is why I like to make my own. If you, I understand that not everyone wants to be have a huge pot of broth on the stove for three hours. That's not like a fun weekend activity. Use your um, pressure cooker. You can do stock in a pressure cooker in under an hour. And then you put in freezer safe containers and can last months. Just we need to we there. need to get a pressure cooker class on the register yeah, because it does so many of these like it makes nutrition and healthy eating stuff. so much easier. Well, especially because like long braising can really s remove a lot of nutrients, especially from bones. Like long cooking is really great, and especially wild rice, heritage grains that take a long time. We do. We're gonna make a note of that. Would you yeah. throw it in the chat? Would you guys be interested in a pressure cooker class? I understand there's a lot of trauma from people who grew up with it as a kid because occasionally they used to just like explode onto the ceiling and then that's traumatizing. They don't do that anymore. They totes fixed that problem, guys. It was a bad business plan to begin with, honestly, and they fixed it. And now they're so easy to use. Does all the stuff. All of it. I use it every week. All right. Asparagus time. If there was ever going to be an asparagus recipe, y'all, this is the time because these guys are all over the market this week. They're in season at spring. Easter is a big time when asparagus comes out for like Easter brunch or dinner. So get them up. You're going to get fresh. You're going to get a good chance of getting local. Love them. 
What we need to know is one bunch, roughly, I'd say sometimes around 12 ounces or so, anywhere, it really varies, anywhere between 12 ounces to a pound. Um, we've got thinner ones here. What you need to know about preparing asparagus is that this is, everyone's got a different way, but my easiest way is the ends can be really rough and fibrous and hard to chew, so we don't want those. So what I do is take my asparagus, bend it, bend and snap, legally bond. Shout out to all you fans out there. Thank you. But a little bit, thank you. Just a little bend and snap. Thank you, everyone. I'm proud of that one. Got it one more time. A little bend. It naturally tells you where kind of that thick fibrous part is. If you're, if you got really thick asparagus, sometimes you might waste a little bit by snapping. So you can take a peeler and peel the ends and you might get some, you only have to cut off like a quarter of an inch at the end and then you can peel the rest. I'm not gonna peel these. I mean, we've, we're on a time limit here, so we're just cutting them, all right? So I'm taking my asparagus and then kind of using that as a guide on how far to cut the ends of these. Roughly about an inch at the end. You can compost these. If you wanna add these to your chicken broth, the remaining broth back there, you can add them in and make like an asparagus chicken broth. Don't waste these. I've got my little onion nubbin. All these things, once I take the chicken out, can go in there and really flavor that broth. So now we're gonna cut these into about an inch size. Again, we want everyone to be similar in size, so they all cook the same. Jenny, it is smelling so good in here. We haven't even added the asparagus yet. So we've got our asparagus. Uh, let me turn that around. Yeah, there's just something about onion, about garlic, about broth. Yum, 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 yum. Okay. And then we're going to take our chicken back here. I'm going to take it out. We're going to add it onto, the, actually, let me get this platter over here. Do, do, do. Get some tongs out. Add it over to this plate over here. We're just going to get our chicken out and shred it up, dice it up, do whatever, however you want it. It's all good. And again, save that broth if you want. It's good stuff. And then I'm just gonna take two forks. A really easy way to do this is if you have a KitchenAid, go ahead and add this into your KitchenAid with the paddle attachment and on low, it'll shred it really quick. Now, I kinda want, I'm actually feeling as I'm doing this dice. Dice is sounding good to me, so I'm gonna do dice. I'm gonna add my asparagus into the soup. Add it in here. Mmm. That looks good. And then I can add, I mean, even just asparagus and wild rice, if you're not feeling the chicken, that's delicious on its own. I'm gonna just take this and kind of roughly chop it up. Do whatever sizes you want. Again, I kind of like just making sure we're getting similar sizes here. Jenny, I forget how easy poaching chicken is. Like, it's such a, like, stealth move. Do you like, think it's the word poach that intimidates? That sounds fancy, right? Yeah, that, with poached eggs, I'm like, oh, my goodness, how is this going to go? I think... But with poached chicken, it's, like, literally, like, water and chicken, and it's so easy to shred and cut and... And then freeze it and have it ready to go. I mean, get a, get a huge amount and then just do it whenever, whenever the... The recipe calls you've got it all ready to go i will say as i'm cutting this this chicken's incredibly i know this is a trigger word for people moist it's very <laughs> moist and nice and tender and that's what we're looking for yeah i think maybe people associate the difficulty of poaching chicken with poaching eggs and they're like i'm not doing that it's very easy and then this is also great if you're making um chicken salad you want to use poached chicken for that. You can also roast this. You could, there's no reason why you can't roast if you don't feel like boiling it. But I don't know. I feel like that's just so easy to do. Okay, now I've got my beautiful chicken here. And this is easy to do the day before. And then you can throw this soup together even quicker. I'm going to add about our two cups of chicken in here. Got them roughly the same size. Any of those juices I'm going to add in. The fact that there's juices when I cut that shows you that it, 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 we retained a lot of moisture in there. So adding my chicken in, turning this up. Ah, oh, this looks so beautiful. 
The asparagus is not going to take long to cook. The reason we're just going to bring this about 15 to 20 minutes. The chicken's already pretty much cooked. So really what we're looking for is making sure that our asparagus is cooked through. But I would not cook this to the point where your asparagus is so overcooked that it's like disintegrating. Because at that point, it can kind of get some, you lose that really fresh flavor, kind of can get some overcooked notes. We don't want that. So we really, this is going to come together really fast now. So make sure you don't overcook this, okay? Last step here before the rice, I'm adding in some almond milk. I'm going to add it in, and that's our creaminess. And with the roux, we want to bring this up to a simmer because a roux doesn't really fully thicken until you got get a nice simmer going, kind of a light boil. That's when you got your full thickness going. So we're going to bring this up to a boil, and I'm going to reduce to simmer. I'm going to simmer about, you know, anywhere between 10 and 20 minutes just to make sure everything's brought together, thickened up, nice and beautiful. Now, there is a reason why we're using almond milk versus um, whole dairy milk, and that has to do with phosphorus so and potassium. And these are two notes where oftentimes we're used to those being really positive nutritional components. If you see phosphorus or potassium, you're like, oh, that's good, and that's healthy. But that's not necessarily true if you have kidney disease. So, Lisa, it, I'm going to turn it to you to just talk about why almond milk versus whole milk and a little bit more about those um, potassium and phosphorus and why we have to watch out for those. Yeah, absolutely. So um, phosphorus, when we have that in excess, when you have um, certain stages of CKD, and again, you have to always check with your physician as well, and it varies based on the level of CKD, but over, over um, consumption of phosphorus, which is in products like dairy products, processed foods, things like chocolate, Coca-Cola, dark sodas, beers, things like that. When you have that in excess over time, it really can start to impact your bones, especially if you have certain stages of CKD, chronic kidney disease, and especially if you're on, you have ESKD, which is end stage kidney disease. Um, over time, that really, really creates a lot of um, pressure and um, it, over time, it will start to really uh, pull the calcium from your bones, which can make your bones very brittle. So definitely something we want to um, really focus on, and it's a really big topic. I spend a lot of time with my patients, phosphorus. I think I could write a book on it at this point in time with how much <laughs> I spend talking about it with my patients. Um, but almond milk versus cow's milk, cow's milk is what has all that excess phosphorus in it because that's where that phosphorus is derived from, whereas almond milk is significantly lower. And certain um, almond milks also have uh, low levels of potassium as well. And potassium, and with that builds up, that can affect your heart. So a lot of times if you have excess potassium going on in your body, that can create um, some significant heart issues. So we really just want to be cautious of that, which is why it's always great when you are attending your physician appointments to get copies of your labs so you know where everything is at. Um, but yeah, yeah, almond milk is a great alternative uh, to cow's milk when we're limiting both phosphorus and potassium. Oh, that, thank you, Elise. That was fantastic. I just, that was, I learned a ton from that. That's really helpful. I can't imagine how overwhelming those first few months are <laughs> trying to figure out this <laughs> diet because that potassium's like in everything. So that's really helpful. And if you are um, newly working on trying to improve your kidney health, if you are overwhelmed, Fear not, there's a ton of great resources out there. Um, one of them being, we're going to drop that link in the chat, but diabetes.org slash kidney. I'm going to say that one more time. Diabetes.org slash kidney for resources, also free classes about how you can improve your kidney health, tips also how um, information, how it relates to diabetes. If um, Elise, you want to talk a little bit about that? What is the correlation between kidney health and diabetes? So, yeah, the two main reasons um, our kidneys fail is with diabetes and high blood pressure. And that, of course, is over time. It doesn't just, you're not diagnosed with high blood pressure and all of a sudden your kidneys are damaged. But yeah. over time, that, com that uncontrolled diabetes control and uncontrolled hypertension, those are the two leading causes of kidney disease. So that's why we really do focus on first and foremost from a holistic dietary standpoint, really limiting that sodium, limiting those processed foods, trying to, you know, stick with the whole foods, stay, you know, in that old school on the exterior of the grocery store, <laughs> stick with all of the whole food sources, try to 
avoid some of those packaged products because that really is the first um, line of defense. Yeah, that's you just said something that's great that I think a lot of people need to remember with health is that the healthiest spots to shop for are the perimeter of grocery stores. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit more about that, Elise, because that's a hack. Absolutely. That's an easy hack starting off to eat healthier. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it's funny, we actually even do grocery store visits with some of our uh, DeVita facilities. Some of the patients really enjoy that. But when you walk into the grocery store, if you think about how things are laid out, as soon as you walk in, you see the produce on the one side, right? So you'll see all the different produce. They'll see the meat counters, the fish. And then when you continue to walk around, you'll go into the dairy. But then when you migrate into the middle, then we go into the chips and the package products and all of those yeah. items that we really don't need to look at as like holistic food. They're not going to really give you those, you know, real good heart healthy benefits as like that perimeter of the, the grocery store. So it's kind of like a quick little way to think about it when you walk into the grocery store. Start on the ends. <laughs> oh, the center sections are so bright. They call to you that the bright packaging. It's just a good tip to remind yourself. Christina, do we have a question? We've got a couple. Um, Elise, uh, folks, they're just is just like so many non-dairy milks yeah. like uh can you give us a rundown of like maybe your faves or your not faves and then are you what do you think about like if if folks don't have uh chronic kidney disease should they be cutting back on dairy or certain things like what do you advise if folks aren't in this boat but want to protect their kidneys yeah so I think if you're in the specifics to non-dairy milks, I think the unsweetened versions are the ones I'd focus on because you can see a lot of different like nut milks out there. You can see almond milks, you can see coconut milk, soy milk, but they could also be really high in sugar. So when you're picking those, look for those unsweetened ones. You can even find like an unsweetened vanilla for like both a coconut or an almond milk. So you can still get that flavor without all that extra sugar. As far as if your kidneys are you know completely healthy, um, not having issues with any of that. I mean, there's cow's milk is, is fine. I would just try to avoid the heavy creams to avoid those saturated fats in excess because cholesterol and heart health is a whole nother part of this, obviously. So we want to really make sure we're keeping the other parts of our body in good shape too. So sticking with the, either like the non-fat or the 2% when, when your kidneys are completely healthy and fine are fine. I just wouldn't drink like a gallon of milk a day. <laughs> and I would uh, the lower okay. Top. Well, yeah. Good note to self. <laughs> Don't drink a gallon of milk oh, today. Gosh. <laughs> but thank you so much for answering all of these great, great questions. Yeah, great job. Um, Jenny, there's a couple questions for you about like substitutions for chicken stock. If you're I not a chicken stock person, what would you use instead? Yeah. Um, at least uh, jump in if this is i'm assuming vegetable stock is fine and wouldn't be too high in potassium yeah so veggie stock mm -hmm. is great go with veggie stock if chicken isn't your thing also mushroom there's a ton of great um like dried porcinis you could add to even up the kind of savoriness the meatiness of a vegetable stock so you can add com combine those two and add that as well um I mean, vegetable, veggie stock is great. I love veggie stock. It's sometimes just on the move for chicken stock, and that's okay. Go for it. What, what other substitution questions we got? Um, how long did you cook the chicken? I, I know we can always use a meat thermometer, no, but is there like a rule of thumb? Well, absolutely. I mean, it's so hard to tell by the color, the interior. I think that's just setting yourself up for flavor, especially from different parts of the chicken sometimes can root a little bit of that pinker flavor and doesn't necessarily mean that they're not cooked. So I always say when cooking any protein, animal protein, always use, always use a meat thermometer. That is what we're looking for. And for chicken, we're looking for 165 is when it's done. You could pull it at 160 just because we are adding it in here and it's going to finish cooking in here. But that's what you always have to make sure that um, if you have any question of whether or not it's cooked, you want 165 as the final. So I it came up to simmer within, I mean, our little burners here are cook, quick. So they did it about five minutes. And as soon as there was a simmer, I turned it off and covered it. And I let it sit for about 15 minutes back there just as I was doing stuff here and then at that point that's when we shredded every piece it depends on how big your poultry piece is i cut my breast in half Ooh, that's a good tip for making things faster Goes faster yeah. just cut stuff smaller it's the thing i always forget about and i'm like we don't have enough time and then i have to take a sip i'm like cut it smaller call it 
cut it smaller, Chef Jenny. So that always helps out there. So we're getting kind of towards the end here. Um, Elise said something that I do want to reiterate, which is whenever you're using plant-based milks, make sure you are going unsweetened and unflavored. I like vanilla. I do not want vanilla in my asparagus soup. So that's something just to keep in mind. It's hard. There's a lot of different varieties out there now, so make sure you're reading the ingredient statement. One of my favorite stories from product development, I worked in corporate for over a decade. One of my favorite stories is I worked for a mac and cheese company, and someone wrote in a letter, because we used to say on the packaging, use yogurt if you want for a tangier flavor. And then someone wrote in and said, could you please specify what type of yogurt? Because my husband made mac and cheese and he used strawberry gogurt. And my, my toddler was so upset. And I think about that like once a week. So this was over 10 years ago. This, I think about that all the time. It makes me a better recipe writer because you have to remember, specify which flavor. So. Everyone, kids at home, please remember, do not use strawberry almond milk in your soup. Unflavored, unsweetened. So our soup is looking glorious. Look at that beautiful creaminess we have there. It came to a boil, I turned it down to simmer. Our roux combined with our almond milk really thickened it up. Who's ever monitoring this, please note, make a note in the log, I have removed the bay leaf. It's out, the bay leaf is out. And I'm just gonna now last step, add this beautiful wild rice in. The recipe calls to cook uncooked wild rice, three fourths cup. That will yield you about two and a half cups cooked rice. So a final amount we're looking for here is about two and a half cups cooked. If anyone needed that translation. Oh my goodness. It smells like spring. It smells like asparagus. I'm getting that thyme. Definitely getting the garlic and onion. Oh my gosh. You got people coming over this weekend? This is an easy meal to bring together that feeds a crowd. This is a big, this big pot of soup, y'all. This will feed lots of people. Mmm, look at that. We've got our chicken our beautiful chunks of chicken. We have our asparagus. Please note here, my asparagus is still green. It's still got some texture to it. it it's not completely cooked down into puree. And I've got that beautiful rice in here. That rice is just gonna soak up all that flavor. I'm gonna take a little bite now because I'm very excited. And I can't wait. I really, I don't know why, but a spear is calling to me when those little spears. Okay. Mmm. Oh, man. Chicken soup dance. It's happening. Oh. Yum. Oh, my gosh. You know, Asparagus and I have had a lot of journey together. Our relationship was not always as strong as it is now. But I definitely learned from earlier days. I was way over cooking asparagus back before I actually went to culinary school and understand you don't need to cook it for an hour. It goes really quickly when you do. It just tastes like spring and herbiness and freshness. Oh, and with the wild rice, the wild rice is a little nutty, so it's adding a ton of depth of flavor in the soup. One, one more bite, just, just for quality control, y'all. Oh, delicious. We did it, you guys. I think everyone's going to come here and have some because this is enough for a huge party, y'all. This is a big pot of soup. Everyone, I want to thank you so much. Oh, that's good. My fell. Ah, I want to thank you all so much for coming and joining us today. We want to give the biggest shout out to our friends at DaVita, especially Elise for sharing all this incredible information with us. The American Diabetes Association, especially Liz for sharing all the incredible information from us. And Molly, you guys are just the best people helping people take care of them and stay healthy. Not all heroes wear capes, so give them a big round of applause. We're so grateful to you guys. Thank you so much. If you love this class, and you're like, I need more resources, please remember diabetes.org slash kidney. It can give you 
all of the information you're looking for. We always want to um, guide you to AmericanDiabetes.com because there's just so much great information on there anyways, including recipes. Um, we want to remind you all for signing up for this class, you are going to get an email later. Um, so in that email will be a survey and we always look forward to your feedback, you guys. We always want to make these classes the most memorable and best fun experience for you. So please Please give us your feedback and what you're looking forward to see and what can be better. Um, we also want to remind you, if you did like this class, if you enjoyed it, then please go on to our Patreon page. Um, Christina will put that in the link and you can help support these classes and um, it goes right back to you and to support and give you guys what you want. Next week, we've got on 411, Argentinian steak with a chimichurri sauce. Ooh. I wrote that one. There's also grilled veg roasted veggies in it. That's a good recipe. And then I think I will be teaching, we're going to do a minis green minestrone soup, and we're going to make homemade sesame crackers in it. Woo! That's going to be great, too. So please join us, you guys. We'd love to see you next week. Thank you again, ADA and Davida. And most of all, thank you to all of you. You guys are our best part of a week is when we have classes and get to see all of you. We love you. Until next time, happy Easter, happy Passover, and keep on cooking. We'll see you later. Love you guys. Bye. Bye.